next to this is our, our final session. Um, uh, it's a Q and A with uh, the MNHS uh, collections management staff. And as Megan had indicated in uh, Paul's session prior, a lot of the questions that were coming up, uh, I think, will be appropriate for for these um, for these folks too. Um, so uh, just I'll go over one more time that just the uh, the ground rules uh, primarily I'll skip most of the ground rules except just ask again people to turn off their microphones and their cameras during the presentation. Um, so uh, um, among our uh, presenters today, Syra Hockey is the supervisory book and paper conservator at the Minnesota Historical Society, where she manages a busy conservation lab preserving general and special collections items for exhibit for exhibit digitization and research researcher access. Her prior conservation experience includes working at the New York Historical Society, the Library of Congress, and the Weissman Preservation Center at Harvard University, among others. Cyber has a master's degree in art conservation and art history from New York University and received her bachelor's in liberal arts from Carleton College. Cyrus is also not uh, unfamiliar with the local history workshop. She helped us out last spring um, with uh, her colleague Jenna to um, how to do um, uh, phase phase wrappers for books. And so those that attended those uh, in-person workshops will remember Syrah. Um, Todd Topper is uh, the manager of collections management uh, unit for the Minnesota Historical Society. He oversees budgeting staff and program for three overlapping teams. Those are conservation, registration and collections management. Todd brings 29 years of experience working in museums, historic sites and archives in Indiana, Georgia, Colorado, Ohio, and now Minnesota. He has served uh, as registrar, collections manager, associate curator, regional sites manager, and building expansion project manager. Todd has was raised on a farm in Indiana and continues to grow his knowledge in agricultural history, sustainability, cooking, and work, world foodways. And he and his wife live in St. Paul. Uh, Third is Dan Kegley. He is the collections manager at the Minnesota Historical Society. He manages all the society's permanent and temporary collections storage areas and oversees the accession process for the archaeology and museum collections. Dan has a master's of arts degree in history from the University of Northern Iowa and after receiving his bachelor of arts degree from Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. He has 25 years experience as a collections manager. And then our moderator for this session is Megan Narvey. Megan is the outreach conservator at the Minnesota Historical Society. She is a graduate of Carleton College with her BA in chemistry and the University College of London with an MA in principles of conservation, uh, masters of science in conservation for archeology span and museums. Uh, she has worked at, as as the postgraduate intern in objects at the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa, Canada, and then as an objects conservator at the Western Archaeological and Conservation Center in Tucson, Arizona. Whew, that is a mouthful. Did uh, Sarah join us in the meantime? Yeah, let's check in with all of our panels. Does everybody yeah, have do a roll call? Microphone working, and you're unmuted, and you're ready to answer some questions. Todd's here. Um, Thyra's here as well. I know that Dan is here, but I'm not sure whether he's unmuted himself. Dan, unmute yourself. I can see that you're still muted. Maybe I should text him. <laughs> OK. Well, while Dan is figuring out how. Oh, I'm here. Okay. 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 We're good. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, this Q and A session with the collections management staff is an opportunity for everyone to ask questions about how MNHS is managing and caring for collections during this crisis and how we're planning in the future. I know everybody has lots of questions about reopening, and I'm not sure the answers we have, but we will take your questions. Um, I was just going to open with the question. Uh, to all of our panelists, uh, what is your role at MNHS and how have you had to adapt your role to this current crisis? So what are you currently up to these days? So I'll go first. So my, my role is uh, still unit manager, but uh, that's changed a bit since folks are working both at, some of us are working from home and some of us have the privilege of actually going in to uh, monitor collections. And you have several other questions down here, Megan, that we're, we're, we'll get into that monitoring bit. But uh, yeah, my, my job is just to uh, keep current with, with uh, staff, with 
ever-changing staff needs, uh, whether uh, we started off with technology needs, and we can currently still have technology uh, technology needs, and uh, just keeping up with staff and uh, and helping them uh, leap over the uh, hurdles, whether it be uh, technology or getting into the building or 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 whatever. Um, I can go next. Um, so as a so I'm the book and paper conservator at the Historical Society. So you can imagine that most of my work is pretty hands on usually. Um, usually I'm working on active treatment of um, you know, our book and paper collection um, at MNHS. And um, you know, I do a certain amount of policy work. Um, policy development alongside that and developing trainings and things like that. So um, at the moment, um, for the last several, um, I guess for now, for the last couple of months, uh, while we've been working from home, that has kind of come on the forefront. So I've been working on, um, I've done some virtual trainings for staff. Um, I've I've been working on developing a policy for reopening and kind of how we handle things like the reading room and collections. And um, today was my first day actually going in to work after those two months. So that's why I was a couple of minutes late because I was dashing through my front door. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I'm going to be helping doing walkthroughs of our collections areas um, and um, kind of whatever, some some prep for um, reopening as well. Syra, you also created a clearinghouse, an information clearinghouse. Uh, for, oh, right. You know, receiving information links from all over the place, and you created a place for them all to park, and and you shared them with others. Yeah, a lot of, um, especially, I think the first month, there have been a lot of resources that have. Um, been posted by a lot of different organizations. So that could include uh, the, so the Society for um, American Archivists. It includes, you know, the um, American Library Association. All of these different professional organizations have offered trainings or advice on reopening and um, on doing collections management during this time. And um, I've created a, a resource document for the, um, that, that kind of contains the most pertinent, or what I think are the most pertinent of those um, resources. Hey, Dan. Yeah, and I'll go third. Um, so security is a big part of my job um, on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the year anyway, whether it be inventory and collections, um, doing the rounds, the walkthroughs, making sure there aren't any water leaks or uh, smoke, fire, all those kinds of things. Um, what's changed, though, is there's been a more concentrated effort to do rounds of spaces, knowing that staff aren't going to be there, during, especially during the normal business hours. So whether it be weekends or weekdays, a concentrated effort on, on walkthroughs, uh, inventories. Um, what I'm doing less of these days are, you know, the storage projects, accessioning collections, dealing with incoming collections. Almost all of that has screeched to a halt. It's really been managing the physical spaces and the collections that we already have. So, Megan, uh, can can we give the the three of us give some context? Because uh, not everybody may know. I, I didn't attend the uh, the earlier sessions, uh, so I don't know how much context folks have. Uh, but um, but we you know since what March fifteenth uh, or something, uh, we've been closed to the public. Um, many of the staff, uh, most of the staff, uh, do not have access to the building, and um, uh, this is related to one of the last uh, last things that I think that we'll touch base on. But uh, I just want to say that having a collections champion at the higher echelons helped out early on in that collection staff have access, and and we actually do rounds. Uh, twice a day, uh, just to check on leaks, make sure everything's where it is and doors are closed. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there that that's sort of the context that we're, we're working in. 
That's great. Thanks, Todd. We did have some questions during an earlier session about uh, whether anybody has access to the building at all. Uh, and we do. There are, as you said, people walking through twice a day and some people have access, but most people do not. Uh, we had a couple of questions uh, come into the chat it, about reopening. And if you guys don't have full answers, that's OK. But I thought I would throw them out to see if you had any thoughts. Uh, Cindy asked, when you reopen, should you have restrooms open to the public? And I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about that. Are you talking about a public reopening? Yes. OK. Uh, Syra, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, so the question is um, whether restrooms should be open to the public at that time. Mm -hmm. And I guess, um, so there's a couple of thoughts I have about that. Um, I'm just thinking about, like, I guess it depends on what kind of restrooms you have and what you have access to, um, to a certain extent. Like, um, you know, are they a large room with stalls? Do you have, like, one, like, you know, basically like a private bathroom? Um, what kind of situation is it? Because um, I know I've read some um, articles about it potentially being an issue um, when, um, you know, like, w when the toilet is flushed, like whether that like disperses, um, you know, fecal um, material. Fecal material, but also like can trans um, transmit like COVID nineteen, and so like that could be a concern. Um, so, I you know like I I don't know. Um, it's a really good question. What do you uh, What do you think, Todd? I, I would err on the side of uh, also local and state code. Uh, it may depend on the size of your uh, institution and whether you're uh, mostly an, an outdoor experiential place or an indoor place. Um, uh, there, there is probably a local or state code that dictates whether you, you should or should not have uh, restrooms open. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, again, another reopening question. Uh, which you might not have a good answer for, but uh, we had been discussing earlier about whether or not members of the public should be wearing masks when they start to re-enter these museums and cultural sites. And somebody also asked whether what to do if somebody refused to wear a mask. And I'm wondering if you, if you guys have thought about that at all yet, or if it's still in future planning. That's kind of beyond our bailiwick. Uh, when, uh, I think our minds are with collections, safety and security. Uh, I don't know, Dan or Syra, do you have a, a comment? Or um, sure. Um, Dan, do you want to go? It looks like you have some thoughts. Oh, I, I, I was going to say, I think from our standpoint, I mean, we're going to just, whatever leadership wants to do as far as the gradual reopening process for our buildings, um, I got to imagine the way the state is going, there's a good chance we're going to be requiring masks for people that are going to go into galleries and such, um, and even for staggering, even for staggering visitation to the show, to, to our galleries, we're probably still going to require masks. Um, I would kind of err on the side of offering masks as well. Um, the some of the protocols that I've seen for for instance for libraries and reading rooms are along uh, along the lines of um, you know kind of following the way grocery stores are working so like having like specific pathways that people follow so that you know to kind of um, you know basically certain halls become one way streets so to speak and um, I think masks kind of go along with that and the thing is um i guess depending on the type of institution you are most institutions have some degree of um leeway in terms of um you know turning guests away because they're you know like there's a code of conduct for instance at mnhs there's a guest code of conduct 
um, for visitors. And as difficult as that might be, like it'll probably go up, be something that leadership of your institution would have to decide how to handle guests that don't follow the rules. But um, I think it would be within, um, depending on when you open and what the statewide situation is. Um, I think masks are probably a good idea, if particularly if you're an, an enclosed, your, your uh, collections are in an enclosed space mm -hmm. and people are coming into enclosed spaces because um, those tend to be areas that um, where transmission of COVID-19 is more likely. Thank you. Okay, uh, since we haven't gotten any more questions into our chat box, I'll return to my scheduled list of questions. Uh, my next question is, uh, at MNHS, we were working on updating the collections emergency plan before this all happened, and we weren't preparing for the possibility of a pandemic. That came up also in our earlier talk from Ann Richards about the business continuity plan. Um, and that was that she mentioned that for the business continuity plan, we all, they also hadn't been preparing for a pandemic. Um, for the collections emergency plan, was it used when this all started happening, or did you find it wasn't adequate to respond to this crisis? Have you made big changes to it? Anyway. Sarah, Sarah, do you want to take that one? So um, if I understand correctly, it's um, whether we're making any changes to our emergency plan. And did you use it when? And did we use it? Yeah. So we did not have, um, uh, I think most people did not have unexpected closures on their in their emergency plan from conversations I've had with um, other museum professionals across the state, across the, sorry, the, the country and even internationally. Um, that was definitely a blind spot that took, I think, everyone by surprise. Um, including emergency professionals. Um, but I can say that we are developing that as we speak. So um, one of the things that um, Todd and Dan, I don't know if you've checked your email, but it's waiting for you there, is a, a document that I started putting together that um, outlines um, what we think the the um, procedures should be. And it's more geared at unexpected closure rather than a pandemic. Um, because from a collections point of view, the big thing is unexpected closure. But um, I think it's worth probably having, maybe we add a section, maybe not in the collections emergency plan, but more in um, handling guides or something like that about like, you know, disinfecting collections or like, what do we know if somebody with health issues has, um, you know, or, or with the virus has interacted with a collection? Like, what are those, um, what are the procedures that we follow? And for the moment, I can tell you that what we are considering is basically um, having like, again, I haven't like written this down. I haven't had as much time to like dig into this as I'd like to, but what we're considering doing is, sorry, my dog has to be in the room. Otherwise he'd be driving everyone else in the house crazy. And he's decided to take his most annoying toy and play with it. So if you can hear any clattering, that's what's going on. Um, so uh, what I'm considering doing is um, having everyone wear gloves when they handle collections items. I mean, that's kind of a basic protective um, thing that people can do. Um, I learned recently that biodegradable nitrile gloves exist. And um, a company in the UK has been um, examining them from a conservation standpoint, and they've, they've passed pretty well. But they haven't been approved by the um, American Medical Association. So they're still available. And then you're not taking um, items away from um, first responders. So that's that's a possibility that we might kind of go into is like mandating gloves for everyone to use. Um, having um, kind of isolate, quarantining items that get used for a certain amount of time. 
um, after they're used by patrons. I see a questions coming up about like how to handle files after after they're done. Um, I know like some um, answers I've seen are um, from other libraries is that they're planning on having those records then be isolated for 36 hours, after which you can kind of assume that the virus is um, no longer active and that a human can interact with those collections again. Todd, do you have any thoughts? Um, well, not going into actual procedures, but with the emergency plan in general, I was, uh, we, we immediately, once we knew that a certain portion of the staff were gonna have their access cut off, uh, we immediately started having conversations about what if we have a disaster right now where, um, are the, the folks, the key people on our emergency plan now don't have access to the building. How do we do this? So we st immediately started talking about how, what, what, what is the, what's the minimum number we could use and who, who are those, who are those key people who have broad access and broad collections knowledge of the spaces and the collection sites. Um, so we did start having those conversations right off and involving uh, other divisions within the organization, and we can we, we we continue to have those conversations too because it's not a uh, uh, we we have a plan, but it's an evolve it's still an evolving thing. Would you agree, Syra? Absolutely, yeah. And Dan, did you have anything to add to that? No, I mean what you said pretty much covered it. It was just making sure that the, all the, our preparedness plan and our call list are still can be accurate and usable even though so many key cards have been turned off temporarily. Great points. Um, I just wanted to also add that uh, from conversations with other collections professionals around the states, I've got, re noticed that the people who seem to be the most prepared for this to happen were people who live in uh, hurricane uh, places. That's not the right way to say that. Um, but people who have to deal with hurricanes on a regular basis have a procedure for shutting a museum down and for low access. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. So um, if anybody is interested in that, I recommend searching some of the institutions that are in hurricane zones, like in Louisiana or Florida, and see if they have any of their disaster plan guidelines online for hurricane season. Uh, okay, you talked about this a little bit, but uh, who has access to collection spaces right now and how often does somebody check the collections and what, what are you looking for when you're there? Dan, that's got your name all over it. Oh, sure. Um, so for the History Center specifically, there are three of us who have regular access to the building and we've been... Uh, Two of us come into work every day and one person's our backup and we're making sure that all the history center spaces that are related to the museum or the library or permit storage rooms, temporary storage rooms, and, and even staff areas where maybe they've worked with collections or we've had a history of water leaks. Um, we've tried to uh, patrol all those spaces twice a day. And then we also, um, within our networks, um, the site managers have been doing walkthroughs at the sites and that we've got a couple other buildings here in St. Paul that aren't our historic sites, but are either storage for large objects or archeology span departments in another building. And we try to patrol those buildings as well. So that's just our collection staff members that do those patrols. And then in addition to that, um, the facility managers and the facility staff that are also responsible for the buildings they're also doing their safety and security protocols as well. Um, so as far as the actual access to our storage areas, there's there's emergent, there's people who have emergency uh, disaster responsibilities that can get in. Our capital security can get into those areas if there's alarms, but generally, as far as patrolling those spaces, it's three of us. And then we're always monitoring uh, all the key card um, all of our building at the History Center at least has a key card readers for all of our storage areas. And uh, we're also auditing that every three days about for the previous three days, who's been going through storage areas, making sure that the audit reports are accurate and such. 
I should add that uh, um, that's seven days a week. So, so for the past, for the past 60 days, we've been doing working seven days a week, two rounds a day. Um, uh, to, and we've actually been, you know, finding little things, you know, that you wouldn't normally see. Yeah, and Todd, and just to add to Todd's point, that's it's making up for the fact that normally our library and museum galleries are open on the weekends. Normally, we've got staff uh, all over the building Monday through Friday during business hours, and so the, the seven days a week is trying to do our best to compensate for that. Great, thanks. Uh, Todd mentioned uh, a bit earlier that you've been thinking a little bit about the possibility of a secondary disaster like a flood. Um, have you been preparing for anything like that? What kind of preparation have you been doing that has been useful when thinking about the possibility of an earthquake or a flood or something terrible happening on top of a pandemic? Well, we had already, that's, that's where the, the current emergency plan kind of overlaps what we're doing now, where we had already started talking about, the committee started talking about doing uh, uh, just you know, little disaster drills or, or um, uh, physical, um, Syra, give me a word. Uh, what, what you just did in DC, um, where there was oh, a lot of- um, like, um, like hands-on workshops. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, doing um, like how to salvage books and paper, how to salvage artifacts. Um, oh, certain, within a certain scenario. Yeah, within within certain certain scenarios. Um, like tabletop. Tabletop, but maybe also hands on. You know, um, one of the things um, I got, I was very very lucky. I got to do a training in um, DC, which. Um, if if any of you are interested, uh, the Smithsonian and FEMA offer a f um, basically a free training. Um, it's a week long, and it's called I think um, Heritage Emergency and Response Training. Um, and um, during that, one of the for instance, one of the trainings we did was on documentation. Um, of how to document items as you're removing them from a disaster area. Um, we had a we had a hands-on scenario where we had to evacuate items from one building to another building. Uh, they made it as difficult as they could. They had uh, someone there playing, you know, the executive director of the institution who's getting very stressed and taking his stress out on on the volunteers who are evacuating his building and things like that. It was it was great. Um, but I, I would like to kind of, um, you know, tweak some of those trainings so that we could do them at MNHS. And those were things we were in the in the process of developing. Um, so yeah. So in the direction of what sta uh, collection staff are doing now, we're targeting. We're 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 doubly maybe not doubly checking, but being very attentive to those areas, like Dan said, that historically have had leaks. And uh, before staff left their offices, they uh, kind of automatically put up plastic, you know, over their cubicles, over their computers, just suspecting that there may be a leak, you know, because we've had leaks before. And if I could add one more thing to that, um, we've, we've got temporary display areas that are near natural lights and maybe the security isn't quite as great as up in our galleries. We've cleared those areas out or temporary storage rooms where maybe the temperature and humidity controls are solid, but they're not as good as our permanent storage areas. And there's been history of water or they're near sinks, you know, like conservation labs, things like that. We've been trying to move some of those collections out of those areas as well. So uh, knowing that uh, um, we don't actually have a real schedule yet for when some of those spaces will start being used again. Um, it's maybe good to move some of those things into better storage environments. Oh, uh, another thing that we're doing right now as we're going through the spaces, and this is related to disaster, one, one thing that maybe people don't relate to as a disaster um, is you know, a failure of mechanical systems. 
or a malfunction of mechanical systems. So as we go through each space, I don't know, we've got a dozen or so um, uh, temperature and relative humidity uh, data loggers, and we're uh, by hand recording as we go along, and uh, we're seeing live real-time data and able to, without plugging it into a computer, just seeing um, what, what the temperature and relative humidity is doing. And then we find a, uh, uh, an engineer, uh, if, if, there's, if there's a weird fluctuation or we see a strange trend, uh, then we talk to the building engineer and then they, and they make adjustments. Uh, great point. Uh, we also had a question from Jacob about moisture monitoring devices. Do you use them in your collections areas? Do you have any advice about them? Dan? <laughs> we don't have as many of those uh, as we want. Um, there's, uh, like a lot of museums, uh, there's, we have an office space below our cafe, um, and that would be the area that I've wanted to put a lot more of those sorts of devices in. Um, so, yeah, we've got fire suppression, obviously, smoke detection. Um, we've got smoke beam detectors, all kinds of things in the building. But we have some moisture monitors, uh, but really it's, it's the, um, the engineers and their, uh, and, their data and their sensors, they'll catch things but we don't have as many of those localized alarms that I would like to have. Um, but the engineers that within the HVAC system and then uh, some of the bells and whistles that they've got set up in this building, they have the ability to notice moisture uh, very quickly. But um, some of their, it does help when there's actually an engineer in the building working with the equipment. I mean, sometimes I get concerned that, uh, you know, on outside of normal business hours, that those moisture meters send the proper alerts to the engineers the way that they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. All right, we had a question about this earlier. Um, and so I think I'll skip to it now. Uh, how have we been managing loans and things like traveling exhibitions right now? Okay, uh, I can take that. Loans that we have, but also loans that we've given to other institutions. Sure, sure. Uh, so when uh, when we closed to the public and and staff were asked to work from home, uh, we have we have two registrars and they immediately started working from home. And um, this is an unusual thing where all institutions are kind of in the same boat. So we have we of course we have loans out and we have loans in. Um, and so the registrars. Would, we're calling each other from you know across the country, and kind of everybody's in the same boat, and they're very understanding. Saying, and we're one of the we're what we're finding out as far as with regards to large museums, we're unusual that collection staff are allowed in and can monitor, and we don't have to, have to rely on building security or or plant maintenance staff to monitor uh, loaned collections. So that's one of the things we're paying very close attention to, or we have a few things on loan from the Smithsonian, as a matter of fact. And we're, uh, I know one of our registrars is in communication with folks at the Smithsonian. Uh, uh, and they're, of course, concerned with security and temperature and relative humidity. Uh, so that, uh, that function, the registrar's function, can, you know, continues. All right. Um, so in this particular case, it doesn't sound like uh, one of the questions we got earlier was whether we were requiring institutions to send back their loans that they had from us. Oh, no, because um, <laughs> in most cases, the registrars are not, well, even in our case, the registrars are not in the building. Uh, and you know the the mechanisms for sending collections are not in place. Uh, I know our our lead registrar has been attending um, uh, shipping uh, shipping and handling um, webinars, and a lot of the fine art shippers have have greatly reduced uh, their routes and their services. So it would be very difficult. Like you know, it would be very difficult right now, and very very expensive, more expensive to uh, send. 
say, a, a, a large painting across the country. Um, so it's safer, uh, safer to just have everyone keep what they have and, uh, and just keep the communication going. Great. Speaking of safer, um, there have been some concerns in the museum community in the past couple months about uh, increased risk to collections because museums are quiet and empty. And there was a situation where a painting was stolen from a museum in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, my question is, what's different about security at MNHS right now? Do you have any uh, recommendations for other museums about stepping up security right now? OK, so so uh, before we, we go into answering the question, I'll, I'll, I'll just set it up that we're not going to divulge what our security is, because that would sort of defeat the purpose of the conversation, right? <laughs> yeah, let's tell you exactly how to break into m and right now. Not, <laughs> right. So Dan, do you want to hand, take this one? Sure. Um, I think one of the, besides having a staff presence in the building of staff that are responsible for the storage areas or the galleries or the library, um, part of my answer would be that it's not just walking through the spaces. It is important to do some of the inventories that you would be doing in normal business times. Um, it's maybe hard if you have limited access to the building to squeeze all these things in, but I think it's important that the inventory work continues um, because then you're not just looking for leaks or, or trying to smell smoke or seeing if a door is ajar, but you really are looking at the physical collections and making sure that things are in place, um, doing data entry off your inventories if you can, so that you're actually recording that, hey, I just saw that, that painting last week. Um, it's important for all the staff to know that that kind of work's going on. And in the case of us, it's important for anybody that potentially has access to the building to know that that sort of work is going on. Syra, did you want to add? I mean, like, without giving a lot away, I can say, you know, like, um, for instance, while we were going through collections today, I mean, part of it was just making sure, like, doors were closed and locked behind you. Um, you know, um, I think, Dan, it seems like you had a really specific way you do the walkthrough every time so that you can make sure that, um, those steps are taken where doors are locked and you know um not left open or ajar um also things like um i had another thought and now it has completely left me um oh i could i could add something and yeah. speaking of the walkthrough we're also randomizing our security checks mm -hmm. uh, so we we don't have we may have a particular route but that route will vary during the day we may mm -hmm. Uh, have you know we may do a security check at eight o'clock and we may do one at two and the next day we switch it up just so we're not predictable yep yep yeah and then uh, and then we're doing audits all the time of uh, policing ourselves and policing others for whoever might potentially be not just not just the storage areas themselves but for us we can audit the entry points into the building so we're you know, those lists, even though we're shut down right now, those lists are still long as far as yeah. who actually can come into the building. And so those audits are important if you can do them. Yeah. And oh, and one of the other things was just like trying to be aware of where things are in the collection, you know, like in the exhibit, how many, you know, um, scarves are up or how many whatever just so that you notice when when there if if there are any changes yep. all right great uh I've, we've gotten a couple questions about taking care of your paper files and stuff especially when people start using them again uh and i was wondering sire if you wanted to share any information that you've gathered about reading rooms and stuff like that for people Sure. So the first thing I can say is that based on all the research that's been done, um, it seems like you don't need to, to to actively disinfect anything. It's a matter of isolating them after use. Um, there are conflicting like amounts of time that you're supposed to leave 
things alone um, in order for them to be disinfected. Um, like I said earlier, one of the um, uh, one of my colleagues at another library was suggesting um, who who I kind of trust on on health and safety things was suggesting um, thirty six hours for um, you know like isolating items before they were um, kind of contacted by by someone else. So that means that maybe you have your one reading room interaction and then um, you know the collection sits for 36 hours in like an isolation room or whatever like a corner of your office and um and then like makes it back um you know um like that basically no patron accesses it until that time like you put it back on the shelf for 36 hours and you leave it um i think the other thing um i've heard people think about is having appointments for accessing reading rooms um, so that you can kind of stagger people you know throughout the day so that there aren't that many people in there at, at a given time um, that's yeah Syra uh, a moment ago you had uh, you were talking about using you know, thinking about suggesting that folks wear gloves mm -hmm. uh, is that including wearing patrons wearing gloves when they're handling books and paper I don't think so. I feel like I would uh, probably um, want staff to be wearing gloves because as they're handling like, you know, archive boxes and things that then maybe another staff member will handle or then the patron will handle. I don't think the patron needs to be necessarily wearing gloves as long as the staff are taking precautions. Um, and like I said, then we're isolating the paper yeah. um, for long enough. And for the staff, actually, part of it is just so that since they'll be handling multiple multiple boxes and dealing with multiple things, it's it's safer for them to be wearing gloves than to just be using their hands. And we're we're relying on them to wash their hands regularly. This way, it's it might just be easier for them to remember, like, okay, I'm not touching my face. Like, I have gloves on. My hands are therefore like dirty or contaminated. All right. Um, well, we haven't gotten any more questions that haven't been answered yet in our comment section, and we're approaching the end. So I will ask my final question, uh, uh, which might not be the final question if we get more questions. But anyway, this is, what have you learned about collections management and collections care during this crisis that you're planning to continue doing, even when everything is completely back to normal? Hmm. That's a, that's, that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to go with big picture and then Dan and Syra can talk about it and, and describe uh, smaller uh, particular things, but uh, uh, championing the, uh, being, being a champion. If you're, if you're a, uh, if you're a collections manager or administrator or a museum director, uh, Keeping collections at the at the at the top of the priority list and reminding folks that that's why we're here. It's the stories with the collections, um, and 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 keeping that at the forefront. Uh, because otherwise, if if we hadn't, uh, if if our our supervisors hadn't been there at the table saying, you know, we really need to be monitoring the collections during. You know, we Dan and I and, and Syrah and others wouldn't have the opportunity uh, to even enter the building and check on collections. Yeah, kind of bouncing off that, like the importance of people knowing what we do, especially at like a large institution like MNHS, where there are so many different departments and everyone does something slightly different. And um, I think it's really important for people to like, as Todd said, like for leadership to know what what we exactly do, so that then when they're making plans um, in a situation like this, they they can make informed plans. Um, but like a really small thing that I was thinking about today was just like, um, 
and this probably applies to nobody, so I'm sorry, it's not a super helpful thing, but I was thinking, you know, we should stop maybe um, letting so many collections be outside collection spaces at a given time, like just generally, like maybe limit the amount of collections items that exist you know, for instance, like I'm really thinking specifically of my conservation lab, which has lots of items waiting for treatment at a given time that maybe don't need to be there while they're just waiting. Um, and I don't know what kind of process we'd need to develop to avoid that or, you know, like whether that would slow down certain aspects of work, but I, I think it's worth kind of reconsidering that. Uh, to give everybody context, Syra has thousands of things that flow through her lab every year. Yep. Um, one of the things I'd love to see uh, that we're doing right now that we maybe continue to do in the future is one that everybody has been so supportive of the auditing, the audits that we've been doing. That uh, you know, generally. The, People are supportive of audits here, whether it be our database or our key card readers. But right now, there's definitely a widespread support of that. I'd love to see that championing of that continue into the future. Um, and then for maybe myself and some of the staff that work with me, we do we do a nice job, I think, of making sure the lights are off in all the spaces at the end of the day and kind of closing down the shop um, and uh, communicating with each other about who's in the building, who's not in the building. But maybe we could do a better job going forward, even with our key card auditing uh, abilities, we could do a better job of just making sure that all of us have been in all the storage areas and, and uh, throughout the building, that maybe making sure that somebody acknowledged that they went through that space on a daily basis. Because maybe when there's hundreds of people here at the History Center, there doesn't seem to be a need or Maybe we haven't always communicated with each other about did somebody really go into art storage today or microfilm storage? But maybe what comes out of this is you know almost like a checklist um, that we kind of keep track of that, and maybe we write down the temp and humidity controls on a notepad or enter it into a spreadsheet just like we're doing right now. All right. Great comments. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this session and for typing in your questions and comments and ideas in the chat box. It's been really useful. Uh, and I guess I'll pass it back to Todd Mahan to wrap things up. Thank you to our panelists. Megan, thank you for, uh, for inviting us. Well, that was great. Thanks uh, to Syra, Paul, and Todd Topper, and to Megan for pulling that together. And uh, thank you to everybody that um, presented today.